So, we defined in this system what a proof is, what a theorem is, what a derivation is and how a consequence is validated. It is not really valid, it is proved rather. right? So, how theorems are proved and how consequences are proved. Then on the way we have given some comments like each axiom is an axiom scheme, each rule of inference is a rule of inference scheme and then each theorem is also a theorem scheme which can be used as axioms later. And similarly, each consequence becomes a consequence scheme. Right? For example, we have proved uh, HS in the last lecture. So, HS says, HS says that P implies Q, Q implies R and tells P implies R. Okay? This is what hypothetical syllogism says. We have proved this consequence. Now, once you see that this is a consequence scheme, that means you substitute any other propositions in place of PQR, whatever you get that is also provable. Fine? This is what it says. So, in that case, it says that if you have P implies Q, you have Q implies R, okay, then you can deduce from it P implies R. This is what it is telling. You can derive P implies R. Then you can write it as an inference rule, okay, which says that we will note it down as hypothetical syllogism, which says P implies Q. Q implies R, then you derive P implies R. So, each consequence in fact gives rise to such an inference rule, which we say as derived inference rules. Just like theorems will be termed as derived axioms, same way you can say consequences as derived inference rules. These inference rules can be used to prove something else. Okay? So, can be used means what? Once we use it, that means you take some instance of this HS. So, where you have substituted P for something else, Q for something else, and R for something else, probably. So, suppose XYZ are substituted instead of PQR, right. So, that means you will be really duplicating a proof of that instance of HS with XYZ instead of PQR, fine, because it has a proof, the same proof can be duplicated and inserted there wherever you want to prove. That is the meaning of derived inference rules. Okay? So, let us try to prove something using this HS as a derived inference rule. So, suppose we give this. Not Q implies not P and that is P implies Q. Let us try a proof of this probably using HS. So, if you want to illustrate how HS is used, we want to conclude P implies Q later. So, if HS is used, that means P implies something say X and X implies R, this is how it should be coming. Is it clear? We want to derive this using HS. So, that means before that step, somewhere we would be obtaining P implies X and then X implies R, you use HS and conclude P implies R. So, now the question is what could be this x, right. If you can fill up this gap, then it will develop to a proof, fine. So, we see from axiom 1, I can take x to be anything implies p, right, but what that thing is I do not know. This is the mystery here, fine. And I see that not symbol is involved, I have only one axiom where not is involved that is axiom 3. Fine. So, axiom 3 looks like not A implies not B implies not A implies B implies A. This is how axiom 3 looks. Okay. If you have not A implies not B, then you can conclude not A implies B implies A by modus ponens from this. Okay. Now, in this case it looks we have not Q implies not V. So, I can take A and B as not Q implies not Q and not V. Okay. 
if we start with that, then we would get not q implies p, right? Implies q. Okay. Now, how to go about what this x would be? We should try. There is no other way but trying it and see whether something works or not. So, suppose I start from axiom 3, I would start this way not q implies not p implies not q implies p implies q. Okay. I may start like this, then I have already not q implies not p. So, I will get not q implies p implies q. Suppose I have got it not q implies p implies q, but I want to have p implies q okay. and I want to use h s. So, can I say p implies this as another missing premise here? Suppose I take p implies not q implies p. Now, you can see if I use h s p implies r, r implies q therefore, p implies q it will follow. Now, how to justify this? It is axiom 1, so proof is done, yes, is it right? So, all that we have to do is start with this axiom 3, use this as a premise, conclude the third line here then introduce axiom 1, then use h s. Okay. So, let us write the proof, you would start with this as first one which is axiom 3. Next second one will be not q implies not p, which is a premise, then by mode exponents we conclude not q implies p implies q. In fact, we should write 2 comma 1, huh? that is the way it is being applied, it will improve readability. Fine. Then what should I do? We have to introduce axiom 1. So, we say p implies not q implies p, this is axiom 1. Next, we would get p implies q by using h s in the order 4 and 3. Is it clear? So, if you want to have a proof without using h s, all that you have to do is insert a proof of h s here starting from this and then go on using this finally, concluding this. Is it clear? Now, once you get that this consequence is provable, then you can say another inference rule from this. Huh? So, let us write this as contraposition. So, C n this says not q implies not p therefore, p implies q. Fine. So, later you can use this as a rule also if you need. Fine. But let us not go on deriving so many things, we have to study this system also. So, let us do some statements or some results about this system, then we come back to the examples. Fine. So, one such reminds us about your five results in the propositional logic P L. So, if you remember they were monotonicity, deduction theorem, reductio ad absurdum, then two substitution laws. Right, uniform substitution and equivalent substitution. So, out of this let us try to prove something, whether that is possible in this system or not. It looks possible, because you see p implies q entails p implies q, is it ok? Why? p implies p we have proved. It does not need anything. No? That is it, one line proof because p implies q is a premise. So, that can be used as a in a proof. 
to just one line proof is sufficient right is that okay but then correspondingly we also have this can you see how it's modus ponens okay but you can just develop three line proof take p implies q as a premise p as another premise use modus ponens to conclude q fine so this hints at deduction theorem you just see that p from this side has come to this side okay can we prove deduction theorem in pc okay let's state it first how will it look like so if it holds let sigma be a set of propositions so now when you say it is a set of propositions these propositions are in pc so that means they use only the symbols not and implies or and if and only if these are not used here now okay then let x and y be propositions so what we conjecture is that sigma entails x implies y if and only if sigma union x entails y okay this is how it should look like fine but we can't give a proof of this by using semantics taking interpretation and models we can't do that so the meaning of these are fixed this means there is a proof where possibly premises from sigma are used and x implies y is the last line of that proof that's what it says and on the other side it says there is a, again another proof where last line is y possibly x is used we don't know right along with premises from sigma possibly x is also used now how to say this two are the same thing if there is a proof here there is also a proof for that and conversely this is what we want to see here it is on the existence of proofs now yes gives y and then put x hmm. and then my modus ponens is y same thing so suppose there is a proof for sigma enters x implies y so take the same proof introduce x conclude y thus becomes a proof for this that is only one part okay let's write that huh? so first you suggested that suppose sigma entails x implies y so that means we have a proof okay whose last line is whose last proposition is x implies y where possibly premises from sigma are used then r to p r to p the following two lines right so what are the two lines x and then y that's all right if you want to document it then you have to say that p has n lines and then you start from n plus 1 here n plus 2 here nth line is x implies y right and then you will be telling x as a premise from sigma union x earlier it was from sigma now it is from sigma union x next you say this is n plus 1 n mp now this is a proof of sigma union x entails y therefore one part is proved what about the converse for the converse what you have let us take stock we have a proof where possibly x has been used and then you have y right 
if x has not been used in that proof Then. No, so suppose x has not been used at all in that case. That is not possible. Then it is sigma and tells y. Yes. Sigma and tells y. So yes. Then for any x, sigma and tells x. Why? You have to give a proof. Yeah, use axiom one. Axiom one, right? You have y as the last line, so use axiom one. Y implies x implies y. The next implies y. Okay. So, that is also a proof in using premises from sigma. So, sigma enters x implies y. Is it clear? That is your first case. Fine. Now, the second case is what? Suppose x has been actually used, then what to do? So, you have a proof where premises from sigma are used, we do not know whether or not but it does not matter. What do we say that x has been used in the proof and the last line is y. Now, how to eliminate that x line and produce a proof where x implies y will be the last line. This is the job. Is that right? This is not very straightforward like earlier cases. We will do it by induction on the length of the proofs, right? Because we have proofs as the objects. So, we take the length of the proofs as a parameter and use induction on that. It is not difficult, we will see. Hmm. So, conversely, suppose P is a proof of sigma union x and tells y. See, our aim is to construct a proof of sigma and tells x implies y. Fine. Now, we prove by induction that there exists a proof of sigma and tells x implies y. This is what our plan. Okay. So, induction on what? Induction on the length of P. Okay. Let us write that on length of P. So, what is length means? Number of propositions occurring in P. It is a finite sequence of propositions. So, its length will define as number of propositions occurring in P. We are doing the induction on that. Fine. So, suppose basis case, what is the basis case? Suppose P has only one proposition, there is no 0 here, right? it is a proof. So, in that case, how P will look? See, last line of P is fixed, right? so there is only one line. So, that line will look like y 1, now problem is here, why? Why y is there? You say it is a proof, right? Huh? It is a premise, premise from where? Huh? Sigma union x, right? So, let us demarcate some cases there premise from sigma b okay it can be x because you are taking premise from sigma union x it may be from sigma it may be x any other case it can be an axiom right trivial so that is third case axiom when in proofs you can use axiom you cannot use any inference rule in any proof, you can use axiom anywhere, right. So, it could be an axiom, we do not know what is the nature of this y, fine. Suppose it is an axiom, then what is that you want? You want to construct a proof of sigma and tells x implies y, 
how to construct sigma n tells x implies y. X implies y we want. Y implies x implies y is axiom 1. Y is already axiom. So, you have got x implies y by modus one. Right? So that will be our proof for sigma enters x implies y. Hmm? So, call that as p prime. A proof of sigma enters x implies y, call it as p prime. Now, we want a proof of sigma enters x implies y. So, we want to construct in each case p prime. Fine? So, our p prime would look like this. What it is? First line y axiom. So, we are taking this case c first, it is easier to see. Fine? So, second is y implies x implies y axiom 1. Okay? Third line is x implies y 1, 2 modus ponens. So, p prime will look like this, which proves that sigma entails x implies y. Nothing of sigma has been used, right? Does not matter, but it is not using any premise outside sigma. So, it is a proof of sigma entails x implies y. Is it clear? Okay? So, once you understand this case, you can also understand A. Right? Because in case of A, you would have written as P, it is a premise, right? it is a premise from sigma. So, it is a premise from sigma, same thing goes. So, sigma enters x implies y. Is that clear? So, B case, A case is also over. Next come to B. How can you write x here? Because x equal to y, right? So, in this case, you should have taken x must be equal to y, that is the assertion now. If you can write as x and it is one line proof, that means it is a premise which is equal to x. So, y is equal to x, right? No other way it can be justified. So, if x equal to y, that means right, x equal to y. So, we give a proof of p implies p or p prime will be that. So, in this case, we take the proof of y implies y that you just know premise, we have already seen it. Fine. So, that proves in this case, that is why basis case is clear. Now, come to the induction step. So, in induction step, first we have to assume something. So, what is our induction hypothesis here? P, P, right. So, if P has less than let us say less than n propositions, then there exists a P prime. So, here we are not writing everything, it means there exists a proof of P stands for the proof of sigma union x n tells y, whose length is less than n. Then there exists a proof of sigma n tells x implies y, right? That is what P prime is. Is that clear? Now what happens? Suppose we have got another proof of sigma n tells sigma union x n tells y, having more than n number of or exactly n propositions, let us say. Okay. So, suppose P is a proof of sigma union x n tells y having n propositions.
our aim is to construct p prime right construct p prime which should be a proof of sigma n tells x implies y that is what we want now how to construct well what could be this p that is how it looks okay. now there are n lines in this proof p whose last line should be y because it is sigma union x and else y and the premises used here should be from sigma union x okay. <coughs> now what could be this y again how did you reach at y well all those cases are possible right y can be an axiom y can be a premise in sigma y can be x equal, right or it might have been derived by only premises in sigma modus ponens modus ponens okay that's what a proof is here proof of a consequence means it has to be derived from those premises so derivation is only possible through modus ponens nothing else right so there are really four cases for this y yes why is there why is there n steps? We don't know. We just have something there, right? Y can be an axiom, and n can be anything. It may be one, it may be two. See, it is still a proof, isn't it? You may not want to write it at hundredth step an axiom and say that this is the proof of that axiom. It can be in one step, right? But there is nothing wrong in writing that. It is still a proof. Is that clear? So it is a vacuous case, but doesn't matter. It is a possibility. So you have to consider all those possibilities. So here, y can be an axiom. Second, y is a premise in sigma. Third, y is equal to x. Fourth, y is derived. By an application of NP. These are the all cases possible. Now these three cases are similar to the basis step. All those three cases, just the same proofs you give. That proof sigma entails x implies y. Right? We are not using any premise or anything. So that takes care of your case, right? As if it is one line. So even if trivially somebody has done it, it doesn't matter. Still we allow and we get away with it. Fine? Is that clear? See, for example, why is an axiom? So then I'll construct my p prime as y implies x implies y, right? Apply M P, get x implies y. So in that proof, nothing is used. No premise is used. So sigma entails x implies y, right? So similarly, all these three cases are done. Now only interesting is this one, fourth case. Okay? So let's see that. So fourth case is case D. That now imagine how the fourth case can come. Y is derived by an application of M P. So M P says that. earlier there should be some two propositions on which you eliminate its first part get y right so that means for some k and some m which are less than n such that kth line will be some z we don't know x or what right some z and mth line will be z implies y then nth line is y earlier somewhere it will be occurring right so p would look like this okay so this m and k can be interchanged which one comes first it doesn't matter 
okay but if you write mk then m should be in this form otherwise you have to write k huh? so you follow this now what happens so consider this portion as your proof p1 okay this much consider this portion as your proof p2 apply induction hypothesis now so considering p1 we say that sigma union x enters z right p1 proves it so i am considering a portion of this proof which is line number 1 to line number m that is my p1 so that is also a proof that proves sigma union x enters z because possibly x could be used there i don't know right so for safe thing i keep x still now similarly up to p2 if i take i get sigma union x enters z implies y so the proof is in p2 fine now p1 p2 of length less than n so use induction hypothesis what do i get sigma enters x implies z and sigma enters x implies z implies y so that means there are proofs so call it p1 prime which proves it and this one p2 prime which proves this or induction hypothesis says there are proofs so we take those two proofs right now we will construct p prime using these two proofs okay so how many propositions are there in p1 prime in p2 prime we have no idea right how many exactly we do not know so suppose just to write it we need that number suppose p1 prime has j propositions and p2 prime has some another l propositions okay now construct p prime as follows so take p1 first up to j next take p2 okay so p1 will prove x implies z so here it is really p1 up to this it is p1 prime right next you take first line of p2 prime here and continue up to l lines so that last line will be x implies z implies y okay so this portion is p2 prime fine this much is guaranteed i just add those two proofs now after adding i have to get what that's what we want x implies y now what to do axiom 1 we have used right axiom 2 we have not used let's use that here so i continue the proof j plus l plus 1th step which says x implies z implies y implies x implies z implies x implies y axiom 2 okay next it should be clear now what i am doing so i get x implies z implies x implies y by modus ponens from j plus l j plus l plus 1 is it okay okay next j plus l plus 3 will be x implies y why 
I use j here and j plus L plus 2 here and modus ponens. Job is done. Yeah. Clear? Huh? So, it says how to construct a proof from x implies z, z implies y to x implies y that is used in only one step. So, if there are many such steps of application of MP using the premise x, then it is not easy to give the proof immediately, but every line has to be inserted and then carried over slowly. Right? So, it becomes difficult, but it is possible that is what it says and we are concerned with provability now, we are talking about the system PC. Fine. So, the theorem is proved, then we can use deduction theorem now somewhere. For example, you take H s, H s says P implies Q, Q implies R and tells P implies R. So, by deduction theorem, we can say P implies Q and tells Q implies R implies P implies R. Though you have not proved it, but deduction theorem says that if this is provable, then this is also provable. Fine. Again, another application of deduction theorem says this is a theorem. Is it okay? Now, for proving this, we can give also simpler proofs. We go back another step, the other direction, right? So this says, this one. This is provable if P implies Q, Q implies R, P and tells R. Right? Now you can have a nice proof of this without thinking, yes, because you have P, you have P implies Q by mode exponents Q, you have Q, Q implies R by mode exponents R, fine. So, you want to do such things later, that is why we are doing this meta theorems like deduction theorem. They are really talking about our PC, which theorems are provable, which statements can be considered as theorems and so on. So, this will help in this way. Okay. So, for the contraposition, you can similarly write a theorem instead of the consequence. So, you have not q implies not p, this entails p implies q. Now, you can write it as by deduction theorem not q implies not p implies p implies q is a theorem. Okay. Is it clear? But then, if you go one step here, what will it give? The other direction. That would say, not Q implies not P, P, therefore Q. That is also proved along with contraposition. This is another consequence. Okay. See, if at all we are going parallelly to semantics, then we should have other two theorems, okay. monotonicity and reductio ad absurdum, but monotonicity has two parts. If sigma is a subset of gamma, sigma is satisfiable, right. then what can you conclude about gamma? nothing. It may be satisfiable, it may be unsatisfiable, but the other direction you can, right. That is if sigma is unsatisfiable, then gamma has to be unsatisfiable, fine. So, the other form says if sigma entails w, then gamma also entails w, right. Gamma is a superset of sigma. 
So, similarly we will have two versions here, right, but then how to introduce unsatisfiability. Yes. Well, if gamma is satisfiable, then sigma is satisfiable. Do you agree with this? Then sigma is unsatisfiable. Then gamma is also unsatisfiable. Right? So what it says directly, if sigma is unsatisfiable, then whatever interpretation you take, all of them cannot be simultaneously one. If you add another still all of them cannot be satisfied right because those things which could not be satisfied still could not be satisfied that is why well now what to do here there is no unsatisfiability there is no satisfiability so you have to introduce something in parallel to that fine so we will call them inconsistent rather than unsatisfiable okay we have to devise some new terms we say that a set of propositions sigma is inconsistent if what happens if sigma entails p and also sigma entails not p for some proposition p Okay. So, this is what you mean by contradictions are there, there is a contradiction in the system, means you can derive some proposition and also its negation, fine. So, that is what we are telling that it is an inconsistent set, everything do not fall into place, it entails p, it gives you p, also it gives you not p, fine. So, now with this definition of inconsistency, how do we formulate monotonicity? just in case of unsatisfiable we have to write inconsistent right so let's formulate it first Then what happens? First thing is if sigma entails w, then gamma entails w. Okay. Second thing is if sigma is inconsistent, then gamma is inconsistent. Okay, formulation is all right. And how do we prove this? Say first one. How do we prove? P implies not P. No, first one. Sigma entails Oh, in this one, monotonicity. You get W only by. There is nothing to prove. <laughs> if sigma entails W, you have the proof of sigma entails W. Last line is W, where premises from sigma are possibly used. That proof itself is a proof of gamma entails W. Right? Possibly premises from gamma are used. That is all. Okay? What about second one? Same thing. Sigma is inconsistent. So, sigma entails P, sigma entails not P for some P. Now, sigma entails p gives you by first one, gamma entails p, use first one again, gamma entails not p, therefore gamma is inconsistent, right, you do not have to argue again, you have already argued, okay. So, monotonicity is clear, then you can formulate redox or Epsilon. So, again we take sigma to be a set of propositions
W also a proposition. Now, say in P L, how did you formulate redox word epsilon? Sigma entails W if and only if is inconsistent now, right? Instead of unsatisfiable, we will say inconsistent. Fine. So, sigma entails W if and only if sigma union not W is inconsistent similarly the other part sigma entails not w if and only if sigma union w is inconsistent okay So, how do we prove this? Sigma entails W. Sigma entails not W previously. Why sigma entails not W? We already have the proof that not W is a part of our. By monotonicity, sigma union not W entails W. And sigma union not W entails not W. Not W. So, one line proof not W. Right? Is that okay? So, sigma union not w is inconsistent. See, sigma entails w. Suppose sigma entails w. Then, by monotonicity, sigma union not w entails w. It is a superset of sigma. Right? Is that okay? So, sigma union not w entails w as well as not w. Therefore, it is inconsistent. Fine? So, one part here you have proved. Let us see one part here. What happens? Same thing. Sigma entails not W. Therefore, sigma union W entails not W. And sigma union W entails W. Therefore, sigma union W is inconsistent. One line proof. Sir, but uh, we do not know that not of not W is W. We do not know that. The in actions do not say that. In PC. No, here we have told it. Yeah. So, I cannot use it. Okay. But you are using that here. Where? Where are you using? You will read it. Okay. Yeah, not not w. No, where? That is why I am formulating two ways. <laughs> if I have not not W, same thing as W, I will not formulate another. Right? Now, think about these converses. If you can prove one of the converse, the other one you can prove. 